Hi, I'm Mason Vale from Boise State University, and this video is going to talk about inheritance. I'm using Java for most of my examples, but the concepts are pretty universal across modern object-oriented languages. Inheritance is one of the so-called pillars or big ideas of object-oriented programming. Now I'm assuming at this point that you've already written some classes and you're familiar with encapsulation, the idea that an object should have exclusive control of its own data and expose only a limited public interface to the outside world. In object-oriented programming, a class can inherit the properties and methods of a previous class, something that already existed. So why would you want to do that? The first answer that people will usually give is code reuse. You don't want to have to reinvent every wheel. And there's a lot of code that's already been written somewhere else. So if there's a class out there that already does most of what you want, and it just needs a few additions or tweaks in order to make it what you really need, you can benefit from all the prior work that went into that pre-existing class. Another reason why you might want to inherit is that you can minimize the amount of code duplication in your entire project or your entire program. It's a little bit cynical, but I always tell my students that every line of code they write is a chance to screw something up. So if you can write code in just one place where it can be shared among several different related child classes, that's probably a good idea. You minimize the code duplication. Another reason why you might want to inherit is to set yourself up for polymorphism. That's one of the other pillars of object-oriented programming, and it's really its own topic. A challenge you might face when trying to learn about inheritance is that there are a lot of terms that are used by different people, often interchangeably within the same sentence sometimes, uh, for these two different classes that we're talking about. We have the old class, the one that existed before, and that's sometimes called the parent class, the super class, the base class, uh, the ancestor class. There are different names for this, but they all mean the class that existed before. The new class that you're writing that inherits from the parent class is sometimes called the child class or the subclass. You declare inheritance in the class header. In this example, new class is the child and old class is the parent. So when we say public class new class extends old class, we're inheriting all of the properties and all of the methods of old class into new class. So without writing any new code, new class is already functionally identical to old class. In Java, if you don't explicitly declare a parent for any new class you're writing, Java will automatically assume that you are extending the object class. That's why in every class you've ever written in Java, you already had a toString method, an equal method, and several other methods that are declared inside the object class. When designing or communicating designs for multi-class programs, it's helpful to draw simplified models that show your class relationships. The most common way that we do this is through UML diagrams. In UML diagrams, classes are represented in rectangles with one to three sections. At the very least, as in these examples, you'll see the class name in a bold font. Related classes, then, are connected by some kind of line with different symbols indicating different kinds of relationships. Inheritance relationships, as shown here, are arrows that point from the child class to the parent class, and we read them is a. So in these examples, child class is a parent class, or dog is a mammal. So in this example of the mammal and the dog, the dog extends the mammal class. You could read that line, dog extends mammal, instead of dog is a mammal. Now the is a way of thinking is very important, and it will be extremely important when we get to polymorphism, but it doesn't help us very much in understanding how these classes are related when we are talking about inheritance. So I'm going to suggest a second model. The extends keyword we use to declare inheritance describes and helps us visualize how a child and parent class are related. The contents of the parent class here is seen as a subset of the child class. The child class includes and usually adds to what was in the parent class. The child is everything the parent was and more. So the child refines and expands on the idea of the parent. The child is more specific and powerful than the parent. The parent, by contrast, is more general and more abstract than the child. This visual image also helps when thinking about how an object's methods will be seen from an outside perspective. New functionality might mask inherited functionality. 
I've pulled this example from geometry because the properties of these shapes are familiar and very well defined. What we see here is inheritance hierarchies can be arbitrarily deep and wide. Any number of child classes can inherit from the same parent, and your ancestry can be arbitrarily deep. Each of these classes is progressively more specific than its direct predecessor, but each is a version of its ancestor. So a square is a rectangle, a rectangle is a parallelogram, and a parallelogram is a quadrilateral. Now note, that means the square is also a parallelogram and a quadrilateral. Everything that was true of any of its ancestors will be true for the square, because the rectangle inherited from the parallelogram and the parallelogram inherited from the quadrilateral. So all of those properties are still being inherited by the square. Now, Java and most other modern object-oriented languages only support single inheritance. That means a child class can only have one parent. Those of you who are up on your geometry probably noticed a square is both a rhombus and a rectangle by definition. It has 90 degree angles like a rectangle, and all of its sides are the same length like a rhombus. But a square in an object hierarchy like this would only be allowed to have one parent. It would have to pick one. Now that might seem silly, but it solves more problems than it creates. And it turns out in practice, most of what people want to accomplish with multiple inheritance can be done with interfaces, and a class can implement any number of interfaces. Let's talk about encapsulation and inheritance. How does the visibility of properties and methods in an ancestor class affect the child? So recall, public visibility allows anyone to access something. So to enforce encapsulation, instance variables, the object's properties, should always be private, along with any support methods that don't need to be exposed as part of the public interface. In a child class, anything that was declared public in an ancestor class is still public and accessible by name. However, private really means private. Private data and methods are only visible and directly accessible in the class where they were declared. So let me be very clear here. Private properties and methods are inherited, but the child can't access them directly by name. They may still be accessible in other ways, if they have public accessors and mutators, for example, or they may be accessed indirectly when they're used by other inherited public methods. If you really do need to access something by name in a child class while still maintaining encapsulation, then we're going to need another visibility modifier. Protected visibility allows descendant classes to access data or methods by name without making them public. However, they will also be visible to all classes in the same package as the parent. Unfortunately, Java is using one visibility modifier to cover two concepts that are separated in some other object-oriented languages, both inheritance visibility and friend or trusted class visibility. So although protected is better encapsulated than public, it isn't ideal. Private is still the best for encapsulation. When you're defining new instance variables or methods, always start with the most secure visibility and only relax it when necessary and only as far as necessary to get the job done. When we say a child inherits everything from its parent, everything doesn't quite mean everything. Constructors are not inherited. Every class has to define its own constructors. However, we can access the parent's constructor using the super keyword. Super refers to an object's parent class in a similar way to the way the this keyword refers to the current object itself. When a super constructor is called as the first line of a child constructor, the child class can let its parent constructor initialize any inherited variables. And this is a very good practice. The parent class should be allowed to initialize the variables it defined for consistency across all of its descendants. So the first statement of any child constructor should be a call to a super constructor. This example demonstrates using the super constructor. The parent class defines one variable, variable one, and it has its own constructor named parent, just like the class, that takes in a value var1 to initialize variable one. Child class extends parent class, so right away it inherits variable one. It defines a new instance variable, variable two, and it needs its own constructor. So it has a constructor named child, and it takes as arguments var1 and var2. var1 is supposed to initialize the variable that was inherited by parent. So the first statement in the child constructor is a call to super 
passing in var1 as an argument. So that calls the parent constructor and variable one gets initialized with that value. After the super constructor call, the new variable, variable two, is initialized with var2. You're probably already familiar with the idea of method overloading. Overloading means reusing the same method name with different argument lists to create unique signatures. It allows you to create variations on a theme. For example, you might have multiple add methods with different argument types. So you could add two integers or add two doubles. When a child class inherits a method from its parent, it has the option to use the inherited method as is, or it can override the method with a new method having the same signature as the inherited method. The original method is still there behind the scenes, but someone calling the method from the outside will get the new version. The new one masks the old one. It allows child classes to specialize inherited behaviors. Imagine there's a vehicle class and it has a move method because vehicles should be able to move. If I had a child class, hot air balloon, and another child class called fighter jet, those two classes might want to override the inherited move method because they will move in very different ways. From inside the child class, the inherited version of the method is still there and it can still be accessed, again using the super keyword like we used in the constructor. So if I called super dot inherited method name, I would get the inherited version of that method. If you've ever written a toString method, you have overridden an inherited method. In this example, I have class override. It doesn't declare an explicit parent, so it implicitly extends the object class, and it inherits as part of the object class functionality a toString method. In this case, though, I've overridden the toString method. I provided exactly the same signature, but I've got a new body inside that method. I'm concatenating the inherited to string returns onto the result of the original inherited to string method super dot to string returns what the object class to string would give me so in this code when i call object dot to string i get the inherited to string returns override and a reference so that override and the reference are the standard result that i would have gotten from the object version of the to string method so overriding a method simply means I'm providing an alternative with exactly the same signature to an inherited method. Unfortunately, it is also possible to override an inherited variable. Never do this. It creates what are called shadow variables. Inherited methods would still be using the inherited version of that variable name, but new methods that you've written in this class would be using the new version of the variable. There's no need for this, and it's usually an accident that's caused when someone creates a child class and didn't pay attention to all of the variables that were being inherited. It almost always results in nightmarish debugging, so don't do it. Overriding methods, that's a common thing, and it's totally okay. Overriding variables, never. It turns out interfaces can also inherit from other interfaces. But unlike classes, interfaces can inherit from any number of parents. It just combines all of the method signatures from all of the parents into one new interface. And then the child interface can add additional methods if it wants to. Between a regular class with data and fully defined methods and fully abstract interfaces with no method bodies, there's a hybrid type called an abstract class. We introduce them now because abstract classes are of no use until they're extended by a child class. They are just placeholders in an inheritance hierarchy. They're for defining something with more detail than is allowed by an interface, but the idea is still too general to make an object without more information. For example, the mammal class example we used earlier, it's a prime candidate for being an abstract class. There are a lot of properties and methods that would be shared by all mammals, but there's no such thing as a mammal animal. There are, however, dogs and cats and other animals that extend and specialize the mammal concept. Because it's declared abstract and may have methods without bodies like an interface, you're not allowed to create an object by calling the constructor of an abstract class directly. However, unlike an interface, abstract classes can define variables, method bodies, and constructors. Yes, even constructors. 
Although you can't directly create an object by calling the constructor of an abstract class, a child of the abstract class can still call the super constructor to initialize any inherited variables. You identify an abstract class as being abstract using the abstract keyword in the class header. In this example, the abstract class includes a variable. It declares variable one. It has a constructor that can be called by children using the super keyword and that constructor takes in an initializing variable for variable one. It includes a public accessor method, get variable one, and it includes one abstract method. Just like in an interface, when I declare a method as abstract, there's no body given, and the keyword abstract identifies it so that any child has to override that method. It has to provide a body for that method or it will remain abstract as well. Once a child class does provide an override for the do something method in this case, that class then becomes an instantiable class. There may be cases when you want to limit inheritance. There may be a method, for example, that you always want to work the same way in all child classes. You don't want any child class to be allowed to override it. There may even be an entire class that you don't want extended. You want this to be the final version ever of this method. The final keyword helps you lock down all or part of a class. If you put final in front of the method signature, it will prevent that method from being overridden in any child class. Putting final in front of the class heading will prevent the entire class from being extended. The math class is a good example of this. If you try to extend the math class, the compiler won't let you do it. Be aware the final keyword is incompatible with the abstract keyword. Final means you're not allowed to override something. Abstract means you have to override it, so they don't play well together. A last word on designing with inheritance. In general, you want to avoid code duplication and make objects work consistently in your programs. So functionality that should be shared by related objects should be pushed into a common ancestor. This can be taken to impractical extremes, resulting in overcompartmentalizing functionality, but if you find yourself duplicating functionality or properties in classes that are logically related in some way, you should strongly consider introducing a parent class.